Good day to you. You know, before the pandemic, normally on an average day, I would probably take a trip in this car, be running some errands, picking up some groceries, doing something that quote unquote needs to be done. And I'd be listening to radio. I'd turn on the radio and pretty much let whatever the radio station I would be listening to decide for me what I'm going to be listening to. And odds are I'm going to be listening to one of two things. I'm going to be listening to an American song or I'm going to be listening to a commercial. And that would be just my radio habits. And then throughout the day, I'd bump into other media probably as well. I might go for a sandwich at Wawa during the day. And on my way out, I'd read the headlines of the Pocono Record or maybe even pick up a copy. I might also see some magazine headlines in there. Radio would be playing inside of Wawa. If I had a dentist appointment like I have today, I'd show up in the office. I'd sit there and there'd be some talk show probably on in the lobby. Probably a Dr. Phil type program, entertainment type talk show type personal struggle type program. And before any of that started, when I woke up, I will have checked my Facebook, my Twitter possibly. I will have certainly gone on to news sites, CNN, MSNBC, Fox, looking at all of them. I might have checked in with some international sources, The Guardian, newspapers, one of my favorites. The BBC also, one of my favorites. At night, when I return home, I might put some TV on, I might watch some Netflix with my wife, my daughter, probably not my son, he's not a big TV guy, and we'd be watching, looking for the latest streaming series to watch, and also looking at documentaries. I watched some of the Jeffrey Epstein documentary last night until I couldn't take it anymore. Yeah, these are my habits. I'd like to ask you what your habits are. What are your habits? When you go about your daily routine before the pandemic, what kind of media were you exposed to? What kinds of media, both in terms of the technologies, radio, TV, newspapers, probably not, cell phones for sure, laptops, what kind of media delivery systems, but also what kind of content? What are you doing with what you're consuming? Are you studying? Are you being entertained? Are you seeking to be informed? Are you wanting to argue with the TV? With people offering opinions on the TV? What are you doing with the content? That's what we're studying in today's video lecture. We're taking on the audience. We're taking on the people who actually consume media. Yeah, the audience. I refer to the audience when we talk about that metaphor of a tree as passers-by. Passers-by. When you walk by a tree, as we've been intimating throughout the course, you don't have access to all of it. This tree right here has parts to it that I can't get to unless I have a ladder. And that tree as a media system is analogous to our experience in everyday life when we go around our lives, really. And the kinds of media that we touch, not just based on the media that we're seeking. By the way, I'm walking my dog here. Hey, buddy. Come on. Not just in terms of media that we are seeking, but also media that come to us by virtue of our traveling around. So we're taking on the audience today. You will note that when you do the readings for today that they end abruptly. And they end really before the ideas about an audience are developed. And that's because the portions that I had to remove from that chapter started to get into what's it like for an audience to grow up in Sweden? What is it like for an audience to grow up in America? So when that got eliminated, what we were left with was, in essence, some very preliminary information about the audience, which I'm going to develop for you here. And then today, you're going to need to put your thinking caps on. I guess that's kind of a childish metaphor, but I'll use it anyhow. And you're going to extend the ideas when you apply your country media response post today. Essentially, what you're trying to do is you're looking at the sample that was posted by the student. And what you're going to do is you're going to apply the concepts from today to explain why the media content is created the way that it is in terms of serving an audience and creating a feeling or a belief in that audience. So you're going to have to do some guesswork. You're going to have to do some, some mental construction of your own ideas for today's post. All right, so let's go on with what we have. And that is, first of all, to talk about the audience as a construct, 
as a concept, as a concept that holds together a set of ideas. And when you read my, my entry for today's reading, you will find that I argue that the audience is actually an artificial construct. It's artificial. Here's what I mean by that. When you watch radio, when you listen to radio, when you watch TV, you may or may not be one of these very few people who are sampled by the Nielsen Company, the Nielsen Ratings Company here in the United States, which measures audience ratings. And they do that through very small sample sizes. And based on those sample sizes, they sell that information to broadcasters. And then broadcasters make decisions about what programs to continue airing or what new programs to develop, whether the audience is there to support that or not. So right off the bat, if you're not one of the sampled people, and I ask you, have you ever been a Nielsen audience member? Have you ever been surveyed by a radio diary? If you haven't, like most people, I have one time in my whole life, about 30 years ago, you're not included in the data that's being gathered. So that right away is problematic in constructing the term the audience. Now, a second problem with the term audience is it is, in essence, an amalgamation of people. It's putting together a bunch of people. Just because you've watched Money Heist and I've watched Money Heist, we will get put into the same, quote, audience for Money Heist. But we may have radically different reasons for watching that show. I may be watching it because I'm interested in learning a little Spanish. I'm interested in foreign programming. And maybe just by chance I came across it. You may be watching it because your professor recommended it in class. Or because it's an assignment. Or because somebody posted a trailer for it. So those are very different reasons. And when you study an audience as an amalgamation, as Nielsen does, by putting together numbers on the audience, by putting together the numbers of people who are 18 to 35, 35 to 54, the numbers of people who are female, the numbers of people who are male, the numbers of people who have an income over $50,000, etc. That's the way that data is collected and the way that it is quantified. It is quantitative data. But it does not tell much about the actual people watching. About the actual, hold on, I have to watch my dog here as we have another passerby crossing over, practicing safe social distancing here. Come on, buddy. Good morning. So, when we, in essence, what I'm saying here about the artificiality of the construct of an audience is just because you have a number of people who have certain characteristics that you're able to measure in terms of consuming a particular media product doesn't really mean you know that much about the people who are consuming the product. But we have to start somewhere, right? Good morning. He doesn't bite. Come here, buddy. So quantitative information in general is limited and also the concept of an audience is limited. Now, we do live in the digital age, and audience membership me measurement is much more precise in the digital age. As I've mentioned before in this class, every time you click on your computer or your cell phone, the push of that button is being measured, and you are, in essence, an audience member. It's just that you're being measured by Facebook, and Google, and YouTube, Snapchat, Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, all those companies are measuring you as an audience. Now, the data that's created on audiences can vary by country. In countries that tend to have a libertarian philosophy with a strong profit-making sector of the economy like the United States, audience data is gathered as a commodity. It itself is a product that must be sold. The Nielsen Company is a multi-million dollar company. Its data is cherished by broadcasters because its data 
makes or breaks how much can be charged for advertising. If you're not doing that well with your content in terms of having a sizable audience, you have to bring the advertising price down. On the contrary, if you are doing well, if you have a hit show, or if it's just performing very well in terms of the numbers, then you can raise your advertising price, the cost of a 30 second ad, the cost of a 60 second ad. So we in the United States just sort of hand over audience measurement to private firms like the Nielsen Company, which embodies our overall media system, which is mostly profit making and it's in the way that it's designed. However, when you go to other countries that have more of a public service media sector, as I mentioned before, many of them European countries, you will find that audience measurement is done at the level of, uh, as is done as a public service. That is to say that the bodies who measure audiences do not have an interest in making money off of selling that data. They are commissioned by government agencies. They are set up by trusts. That means organizations that raise funding to establish money that is going to be used to purchase services, in this case, audience ratings. And that money is not gonna come from parties who are interested in having a return on that money in terms of a profit. So you have a lot of data out there in your France's, your Spain's, your Italy's about people's behaviors about people who go on Facebook in the morning and who also watch sports. Hey buddy, come here. About people who, who are constant users of Twitter and their political positions. About people who read a lot of books and their degree programs. These are all ways of looking at, at people as individual audience members in terms of the media that they consume and the habits that they have that go along with those consumption habits. And so audience data itself is affected by the philosophy of a country, the country's cultural characteristics, etc. Now, what I wanna do is end this instructor video by setting up for you how you can approach your country media response post for today. In essence, what I want you to do is to take a rhetorical perspective. What a rhetorical perspective does is it asks how media content invites us to feel or believe. Many of you, for example, have written about RSC columns in this class that had to do with, ad with advertising, and you made it a point in your R RSC columns. Sometimes it worked with the assignment requirements, sometimes it didn't, but I just wanna raise it here because it's pretty common for all of you to know about this. You talked about how advertisements make you feel because of their pace and because of the messaging that they give. They can make you feel anxious. They can make you feel tense. They can make you feel like you have to rush to make a purchase. They can make you feel like you're inadequate. They can make you feel like you can become better. They can make you feel a lot of different ways advertisements by virtue of the way that they are constructed in a fast pace. You know, so come on down right now before this sale expires kind of way. So when you approach today's sample country media posts, I'm going to ask you to ask, how does that invite you, if you were a person growing up in the country of that sample media post, how does that sample media invite you to think about the world? Now this is where you're gonna to have to stretch your mind, especially if you've never been to the country that you've been in. But you've gotta find a way in this post to talk about how the media is constructed, the sample media content is constructed in a certain way because of its desire to appeal to getting the audience to think or believe in a certain way. That's about the most that I can give you to help you with this post and also to help you with audiences because ultimately understanding the audience is a personal enterprise. You have to exercise your own thinking, your own creative thinking, to understand how a person might grow up to think or believe based on how they are invited to think and believe by the media content that they are accessing. I'll give you one final example to drive the point home that's not related to media. Again, it's a parallel way of teaching here. It's talking about a metaphor. 
so that you can hopefully draw the conclusions and transfer them over and apply them in your post. When you go into a bank, I don't know if you remember that, going into a bank, how are you invited to believe by the way that the bank is designed? Well, first of all, you have marble counters. Marble counters are not cheap. They're also very strong. And so one message right there is you're invited to believe that the bank has money which you want to believe, right? You don't want to believe that your bank is on the verge of bankruptcy. Otherwise, you wouldn't keep your money there. So marble counters is one subtle piece of information that you are taking in when you walk into a bank that is inviting you to believe a certain way about the bank. Then secondly, when you go to talk to a teller, you're not sitting in chairs at the same height. No, the teller is behind usually a plexiglass screen. They're usually sitting up higher than you. You usually don't get to see the cash drawer that they're going into to give you the money. So there's a power relation differential there just by virtue of the way that the bank is set up. The teller has more power than you in that circumstance and, and they should, right? Because we want to have messages, if you're a bank, that are reinforcing the idea that this bank cannot be robbed. This bank's integrity cannot be compromised by you seeing amounts of cash in the drawer and by being on the same equal level as the teller. In that context, you're not. So this is the content of a bank visit inviting you to believe or a certain way that your bank is safe, that your money is safe, that the bank has safeguards in place and that the people who are handling your money know better than you do what to do with it and and that's okay because your money is safe. It's that similar sort of approach that you want to take with today's country media posts. I hope you enjoy your day.